Welcome to the Get Published Podcast, sponsored by Birdie Consulting Group. To get more information about our coaching, publishing, executive ghostwriting, and podcast production services, go to getpublishedpodcast.com. Hello, I am Paul Brody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Get Published Podcast, where we help authors get published with a proven system that works. Today, we're being joined by Dan Clay, author of How to Write the Perfect Resume. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. Are you ready to get started? I am. All right. Question number one. What is the one piece of advice that you would give to a first-time author who is currently writing their book? That's a great question, Paul. So uh, I think for me, what was really important was to, to figure out a writing process that works and then stick to it religiously. So uh, I, I remember a story about Jerry Seinfeld, um, one of the philosophies he has around writing jokes is that you should always be putting content on the page and writing jokes every single day consistently. It doesn't matter if some of it's crap, a lot of it will be, but that's how you go about creating new material and constantly pushing the envelope of what you're able to create. So I think it's especially important to, to be creating every day, to force yourself to put words on the page, even even though, and perhaps especially when you don't feel like it. Uh, and so the process that I figured out for myself was I, I realized that I'm a much more creative person in the mornings. And so what I would do is wake up fairly early. I still have a full-time job, so I had to do it pretty early in the morning. Uh, wake up, go to the gym, uh, get ready, make myself a cup of coffee, and then sit down and, and write for an hour or so in the, the calm, still silence of the morning. Now, that's just me. You know, I know a lot of folks like to do their creating in the evenings, maybe late night if they have children, once the kids are in bed, uh, grind out a few words, um, you know, late at night. But uh, it's important for everyone to to identify their own process that's going to work for them and then be especially disciplined in following it, even when it's tough and even when they don't necessarily feel like doing it. Yeah, I agree completely with you because – you have to have that accountability. You have to have that power of habit. So one thing I did was I was actually a few days behind in regards to my 14th book, which is ironically enough about podcasting. And last Saturday, last Sunday, I told myself, right, this gets done today no matter what. And I was four chapters into the book. And I was like, whatever it takes to get this book done, I'm doing it. So I went on StubHub. I bought two tickets for the Cowboys game that was the next night. I'm like, right, I get this done in time. I'm going to the game. And if I don't, then I'm out about 150 bucks. <laughs> so that was kind of like my, <laughs> my accountability piece. And it worked. One thirty a.m. Monday morning, it was done. It was sent to my editor and went to the Cowboys games the next night. So just having that different level of accountability, but also getting into that power of that habit, too, of getting it done. That That's great, Paul. Yeah, you know, that's one of the crazier stories I've heard. I forgot who this person was, but it was someone who was, I think it was a movie writer or an author or something who really needed to just eliminate all distractions. They, they booked a round trip flight, direct flight from somewhere in the U S I forget it was, if it was LA or New York or whatever, direct to Tokyo and then immediately turned back. So literally they were on the plane for, you know, 10, 12 hours or whatever, got into Tokyo, stayed in the airport for like an hour, and then turned around and went back to the U.S. And the entire time they were on the plane, they were writing and, and just grinding and focusing. Now, that's extremely uh, that's extremely dedicated. I don't know if I'd be able to do that myself, but uh, just an example of extreme dedication when it comes to forcing yourself to create. Yeah, and I think it's just whatever it takes for that person to get it done – then that's one of the best yeah. things. What I like to do on planes as well is I'm either reading or I'm actually writing because it's just a great opportunity. You're in that plane. You're not going anywhere. If you're flying to Maui, you're flying international, you're probably not going to have Wi-Fi. So might as well be productive and get on with it. I'm the same way. I always have a little a little irk about uh, people looking over at my screen to see what I'm writing. So I, got, I had to get a privacy filter to kind of tone out that that sense of judgment that other people uh, were looking at what I was putting, putting onto the page. Cause a lot of it, you know, as you know, when you're writing, a lot of it is not ready for prime time. So just a personal thing though. I thought it was kind of funny. Well, what do you feel is the hardest part about getting published? 
Sure. So I think there are there's there's a very important distinction, as you know, between writing, writing words into a manuscript and then polishing them into a finished product that people want. And at the end of the day, that's what a book is. It's a product, right? So it's not just the, the words that are within the manuscript, but it's also the copy on the covers, the, the inside and, and front pages, the chapter breaks, the, any illustrations you might have, the, the, the title of the book, um, the, the distribution, the marketing. It's all of that stuff sort of wrapped up into one. And it's very much a, you know, when you take a book from pure writing phase to publishing phase, it, it becomes a whole a whole new set of complex uh, complex tasks that need to be done. And it takes a bit more of a project manager mindset than just a pure writer creator mindset. So I think one of the most difficult things for me was making that shift, especially as we mentioned before, having that 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 habit of sit, sitting down every day and putting words on a page. Once you're into that habit, it can be tough to pivot to the next phase of creation, which is putting all those pieces together and polishing them into a finished work. So I, I think really that knowing how to shift those gears and, and leveraging all the resources you have available to you, whether that's your, your editors or um, you know, the publisher itself or whoever you're hiring for, for designing cover or anything that has to do with the book formatting is really um, being able to coordinate all of those. And it's almost like conducting a symphony, right? Um, putting together a, a, a final work that's really going to make you proud and make your audience happy and be something that you're happy to put out into the world. Well, let's talk about marketing. Speaking of sympathies and um, symphonies and getting things to peak, let's talk about marketing. So please share a marketing yes. strategy that you have used in your book launch that worked well. Sure. So my my the, the aim of my book was slightly different than I think what most authors shoot for when they publish a book. So typically, I think a lot of authors will will go into it with the intent of of selling books, right? I mean, they you know want to make some money, get their work out there, you know, prove that they can they can do it, they're creative, whatever the motivations might be. So that was all wrapped up into my goal, certainly. But the primary goal of my book was really to grow my email subscriber list for for my career consulting business. And so throughout the book, there were were references to uh, a group of supplemental resources that I created in association with the book that I then created a, a standalone website for to um, allow folks who are reading the book to, to come into that site, enter their email address, and then download those resources. So for example, um, there are a set of resume templates that come with the book. Kind of hard to include a you know, Microsoft Word document within a, a published book. Uh, kind of tricky. So I, I felt that the format of having a, a single website where people could go to access those to complement the book was, was a good one. And so uh, so with that goal in mind of, of maximizing email subscribers, what I did was I enrolled the book in the Kindle Select program, which is been a, basically an exclusivity agreement with Amazon. They allow you to do some things in there that, um, that non-select authors can't do. So things like free promotions, uh, countdown, countdown promotions. I think there are a couple of other ones. But um, what I did was I, I engineered the launch such that I had planned a, a couple of promotions uh, with other book promotion websites alongside an Amazon free promotion. And so I ran a free promotion for, I think it was five days. And that was able to generate several thousand downloads, free downloads granted. So these weren't paid, but my, my ultimate goal was not to drive revenue from this initial launch. My ultimate goal was to maximize the people um, who, who downloaded it and therefore generate the email subscribers that I was looking for. And to a large degree, especially for a debut author like myself, I, I was very pleased with the results. So I was able to, to generate, like I said, thousands of downloads of the book, um, got a significant uh, number of reviews from those, um, as well as uh, a, very, a very decent number of email subscribers, which has continued to, continue to build even past the free period. So now that it's transitioned to a paid product, People are buying the book, and I'm still getting email subscribers trickle in as those folks are uh, reading reading the 
um, you know, reading the supplemental materials in the book, seeing the website, and then signing up that way. So I thought that was very successful. And that's one thing I always tell my clients too is you make good money on the front end with your royalties, but you make the life change in money on the back end. So my philosophy has always been to give as much as possible. And with the exception of my travel books, anytime I've launched a book, I've always had the book available, the Kindle version for free for several days because it does work. It builds your list, it builds those relationships because you have to run your book like a business. And it sounds like that's exactly what you've done. That's uh, that's a great point, Paul. So, a qu question for you that uh, that I that I was thinking about looking into the future. So, as a as an author who's published fourteen books, you still find it helpful, even though you've certainly established a certain degree of traction in the marketplace. You still find it helpful for you to run free promotions when you launch a book, even though you know you could probably leverage your existing audience to jump right into uh, into a paid product. Absolutely, because my books are on different areas. So we have someone's self-help, okay. health and wellness, travel. We have uh, book publishing, and now with this next book, podcast production. So anytime that you've got those different areas, you always want to focus on getting that book out to as many people as possible. I see. Interesting. That's that's great to know. I want to ask you about these resources. So you talked about their different templates. Were you offering this at the end of every chapter, or how were you offering it in the book? That's a great question. So, so I went about. There were three main areas where I where I mentioned them. So, the in the very beginning of the book, there's a page that specifically says, "Hey, there are some free resources offered with this book that are going to help you um, help you implement the recommendations that you'll find throughout. If you want to go uh, check them out for yourself, you go to the website, enter your email address, and you'll get them. Then I also mention them throughout the book. Um, as the topic comes up. And so, for instance, when I'm talking about how to structure your resume, there's a little blurb, sort of a call out. It's a, it looks different um, visually than the rest of the book, so it's easy to distinguish. That has a little document icon that says, hey, if you're interested in, in uh, reading more supplemental materials, download the five easy-to-use resume templates or whatever it is. And then I mention it again at the end of the book. So, Hey, if you haven't already, go to danclay.com slash perfect resume, download your materials, and you'll get all these for free, whatever it says. So three distinct areas. I, you know, I, I didn't have the ability to A-B test in any way. That just kind of felt like the best way to approach it. So I'm not sure if it would have been better just to, to leave it out of the front or the back. But I figured the more places, the merrier. Give people the, as many chances as you can in case they missed it. To, to go to the site and download their materials. Well, I'll share with you one tactic that I, that I do, and I actually learned this from Kevin Cruz a few years ago, is I have those offers at the end of every chapter. So as you mentioned, you're covering a specific area. So I'll go, hey, to get more information about editing or about formatting, then check out this resource guide. So it's the same guide, but it's, it's basically broken down and it's tailored with files specifically for that chapter. Now, I don't typically have it in the front of that book. I might have it in front of a different book. But what I'll actually, especially if it's part of um, like a series. But yeah, at the end of every chapter, if you're offering those resources, that's such a great strategy because at the end of the chapter, okay, they're about to go to the next one. Oh, here, tap here to get, get my free resource guide or tap here to get more information about this specific area or to get more information about resume writing or to get my templates. So that's always a great way to tailor it at the end of each chapter because I think that's one thing that a lot of people miss out on. There's always opportunities to get people funneled over to your website and to your email list. And it's just making sure to take advantage of all of those in the, in, and without doing it in a salesy type of way. I love that, Paul. I'm going to have to steal that from my next book if you don't mind. No, go ahead. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let's talk about your favorite book. So what is your favorite book and what was the number one thing that you learned from it? Yes, this is a great question. I really, I really enjoyed thinking about this one because the, the answer came so easily to me. So I would say my favorite book is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Are, are you familiar? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure who isn't. Um, so, mm -hmm. so this one really had a transformational effect on me, in particular the part where he recommends going on a low-information diet. I'm not sure how long, how long ago you read it, but – one of the parts he says, you know, in order to kind of clear your head and and narrow your focus on the things that are truly important, you need to tune out all the distractions in your life. So so take five days, 
and turn yourself off from all kinds of social media, all forms of online blogs, basically all kinds of digital content, and really just let your mind be free. And I really took that to heart. I actually, being the overachiever that I am, I, I decided that I was going to do this for 30 days instead of five. And it, it really changed everything for me. It, everything became clearer in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. My, my, my attitude towards everything just became more, uh, more clear, more focused. I was much more productive. And that was actually what seeded the initial stages of writing how to write the perfect resume. That was when I decided that was a path that I wanted to pursue. So, um, you know, while everyone certainly is not going to detach themselves from, from social media or whatever for 30 days, you know, I think everyone can, can take that lesson to heart. And even if it's just for you know, half a day, a day, a few hours, learning to, to create boundaries between the distractions and between what you really need to get done, I think is important, especially for writers, right? When we're creating, it's so important to focus and, and be immersed in the work. That way your neurons are bridging the connections they need to, you're, you're firing on all cylinders and distractions just get in the way of that. So that was, that was really one of the key takeaways. It's not the, the key takeaway that I took from four hour work week. Certainly there were a lot of others, but that one was transformational for me. So you unplugged for 30 days straight. I did. Yeah, it was a, it was a wild time, let me tell you. <laughs> now, that also includes email. No, not email. So I, I, made <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I, I made special rules for email. So I, I, was, I was still in my full-time job, obviously, so you couldn't step away from that. But for my personal email, I uh, made it a point to only check that once a day. So I would check it um, – go through any emails that needed to be answered and then not look at it until the same time the next day. So, so it, it really shifted it from being a sort of always on tab in my Chrome browser where whenever I see the little notification pop up, I jump over, see, okay, who's emailing me now to treating it like a mailbox, right? Where you're collecting the mail every day and, and responding to it that way. And now, now I've since moved back to a, a bit more of a liberal approach. So I'll check it maybe, you know, four or five times a day. But um, I think the the effects have been long lasting, and I still I, I'm still realizing the benefits from them in, to some degree. So even with your phone, so you weren't going on any social media on your phone either. No social media on my phone, and I actually even did away with text messages. Wow, which sounds pretty crazy. My which my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, found somewhat infuriating at the time. But you know, it had an interesting effect because. Because we couldn't, or, or I wouldn't, self-imposed limitation, communicate through text message, it forced us to communicate over the phone instead. And actually, that kind of became the new norm for us in having deeper conversations over the phone versus the, just these sort of surface-level conversations via text message. So there's certainly unintended consequences that I, I didn't expect. Um, but certainly welcomed uh, after the fact. So it was it was an interesting time for sure. Tough, tough, tough definitely, but uh, ultimately rewarding. Yeah, I was watching I Am Not Your Guru on Netflix yesterday, the, the um, Tony Robbins documentary. Oh, the Tony Robbins, did. sure. And, and the one thing he was I talking about. I haven't seen that. Well, it, it's awesome. I d highly recommend it. It's it's a two hours. It goes really fast. It's about one of his big events that he does. But the one thing he talks about is the one main thing people need right now and are lacking is more depth. And that sounds like it's exactly yeah. what you did with utilizing the phone. And, and I'll tell you my story. So I did the National Day of Unplugging a couple of years ago. And it was weird. It, I literally felt like I was going through some sort of withdrawal because I would try to grab my oh, yeah. phone every few minutes. I'm going, what in the world am I doing? And so I documented the whole day <laughs> in a notepad. And that notepad actually, that whole day became a chapter for my third book, for Positivity Attracts, when I was talking about disconnecting and unplugging because it was so weird to go through that. But what happened out of that? I had better conversations with family that were at the house. I went outside. I you know, relaxed by the pool. I was able to just enjoy the day. I even read a book versus the Kindle version. I mean, it was just... It was really a game changer, and quite frankly, it's something I need to go back on and doing that just to cut out that static because there's so much static right now, especially with social media out there. Totally agree. Yeah, I, I think it's something that people 
will never realize what they're missing out on until they actually try it for themselves. And the, the concept sounds scary just because we're so connected to our devices and, and all kinds of information nowadays. That it's almost become an extension of ourselves. And when you cut that off, it's almost like cutting off an appendage. But once you realize the benefits that it brings and, and just the clarity that you're able to gain and, and the, the realism of the interactions you're having, like you said, you know, you go out, you're, you're breathing the fresh air and you're, it's, it's almost like a level of presence that you don't typically get day to day that you're able to, to exercise when you're, when you're cutting off the minutia and those kinds of distractions. So, um, you know, certainly living in a digital world now, you, you kind of, you can't necessarily be a, a nomad and, and cut yourself off entirely. Although I'm sure millions of people, you know, millions of people do that inadvertently, but um, you know, it, it's important to, to, to strike a balance with everything moderation, right? Well, one thing I learned out of that and just to have that focus was any time that I am working on my books, I turn off of the Wi-Fi and I shut off my phone and just it's amazing how much more you can get done when you just focus on one thing and monotask versus multitasking. It's really is a game changer. So true. Yeah. So I, I like to to actually physically remove my phone from the room. I won't even have my phone in the same room as, as I'm as I'm in because it's it's just it, it's something about it. It's just like a, a distracting presence. So it's best just to remove the distraction entirely. Absolutely. What's well, for a final question? Let's talk about your favorite quote. So, what is your favorite quote and why? Yeah. So my favorite quote you actually find on on my website. Um, I can give you that that URL in a second here. But a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Senior, and the quote is, "Alas for those that never sing." but die with all their music in them. And that quote is the perfect embodiment of my life philosophy. I believe that one of our true purposes in life is to, is to release that song hidden inside of, of each and every one of us, right? We're all, we're all brought into this world with innate talents and gifts to offer the world. And, in order to to give the world those unique gifts, you have to go out and and try and struggle and put yourself out there and and just go for broke, right? And and I think one of the things the quote is expressing is the tragedy of those who who don't do that, who sort of uh, coast along, who who don't who don't push themselves to go beyond their comfort zones who who sort of settle into this state of blissful mediocrity for for lack of a better word but it's something that I hold near and dear to my heart and I think that you know if more people took that view there'd be so many more people realizing their full potential and 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 truly fulfilling the purpose that they were put on this earth to achieve and so and that's actually one of the, you know, one of my goals as, you know, as a career writer and, and advisor is to help more people connect with that song inside them and, and figure out what it is they were put here for and, and what's going to make them ultimately happy and fulfilled with whatever it is they're doing with their life. So that's the quote. I'm not sure where, I can't remember where I came across it, but when I did, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. I feel the same way in regards to stories. And I, I firmly believe every single person has a story in them. And that's one thing I always talk about is my philosophy is to help as many people get their books out there to get published as possible because everyone has a song, everyone has a story. And it, I, mean, I feel it's my role to help them bring that out. That's great. I'm, I'm glad we share the same vision there. And uh, you're doing it with publishing and you know I'm, I'm attempting to do it here with careers and we're doing the best we can to uh, to help people find their inner songs. I love it. Well, Dan, I want to thank you for being a guest on the show. What is the best way for people to find you online? Sure, uh, a couple ways. So if, if people want to follow my updates, I, I produce a weekly newsletter. People can sign up for that at my website, danclay.com slash sign up. And if folks want to follow me on Instagram, they can find me at danclay. Dan, I want to thank you once again for being on the show, and I wish you all the best in your author journey ahead. Thank you, Paul. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure speaking with you, and uh, best of luck to you as well. 
thanks again for joining us today. To learn more about how you can be featured in our brand new Get Published Business Book, go to getpublishedpodcast.com.